Hello, welcome. Welcome to this week's online worship with South North Baptist Church. It's great to have you connect with us today. My name's Pete, I'm the minister of the church. And whether you're a regular part of our church, regular viewer of this channel, or just checking us out, we pray you'll be blessed, encouraged, challenged even, by joining our online worship today. The animation we open with reminded us of God's goodness, to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and that this is the day that he has made. Every new day is a gift from God. So we're gonna take a moment to thank him, to worship him in song, whatever you're doing right now, let's praise God. Lord, we thank you, we give thanks to you today for life and breath, for your goodness and love, which endures forever. Whatever we are now, whatever our mind is on, may we see you afresh, know your presence and grace, and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
As I said at the start, it's great to have you join with us today. If you'd like to know more about our church, where we're based, what we believe, if you have any questions, do get in touch with us. Full contact details are at the end of the video. You can find us on social media. Just search for South North Baptist Church on all the major platforms. Make sure you subscribe, like this video. That means you don't miss out on anything, but it also helps us with the algorithms and, and all that stuff. One of the things we often encourage on these videos at the end, I often say, get in touch with someone. In other words, being a Christian is not just something we do on our own. We believe we're in this together, that church is about family. And so if you're part of our church, when you've watched this video, why not reach out to someone and encourage them? If you're part of another church, why not do that? And if you'd like to know more, as I say, do get in touch with us. Thanks to everyone who contributes financially to the work of our church. I'm going to briefly just put on the screen our bank details, our giving details. We're grateful for everyone that supports our family pot so that we can do the ministry we believe God has called us to. We're going to take a few moments in prayer now. So let's pray together and then we're going to hear our Bible reading for today. Let us pray together. Father God, we worship you this day and praise you, for you are, you are the one high God. Thank you for your everlasting love that you have for us and for the hope you bring each and every day. God of hope, we thank you for being among us in the storms we face in each situation. We praise you and thank you that you go before us and guide our footsteps, for you are our help and our shield. We bring our prayers to you today and pray you will comfort those in need, for you are the mighty comforter. Strengthen us through your power and Holy Spirit. Renew and fill us afresh through your Holy Spirit. Guide us daily into the people you want us to be, O oh Lord. Open the doors of opportunity, enabling us to help others, think of others and show others your love in different ways those at home and abroad. May the focus of everything we do be to the building of your kingdom, that your name may be glorified forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Eodia, I plead with Sintich, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, 
will guide your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I'm going to focus on just one word in the Bible reading today, and that's the word true or truth, and how that relates to holiness. The Philippians passage begins with Paul telling them to stand firm and encouraging one another to be in accord with one another. In the previous chapter, he tells them, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that is our theme for this year and this series. It is interesting to note in the pattern of Paul's letters, generally speaking that is, he doesn't actually tell them what he wants them to do until about three quarters of the way through. And in verses 8 and 9, Paul is telling them what to actually think about. A commentator says this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What is the holiness that we're talking about here? When Paul writes many of his epistles, he addresses them to the saints in that place. Now, the word for saints literally means holy ones. In the opening lines of 1 Corinthians, he addresses the letter to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. In 1 Peter, Peter addresses his letter to the elect and chosen and exhorts them to be holy. In 1 Peter 1.16 he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And he's quoting a passage from the Old Testament. And then again in 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that ye may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The saints of the Holy Ones are those set apart, separated, if you like, chosen for God's holy purposes, and that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That brings us on on to God's holiness. God's holiness is revealed through his attributes to us. His wisdom in the exercising of his total power. Everything he created, he declared to be good. He knows everything, sees everything, and is ever-present. He is beyond time. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the end from the beginning. We cannot comprehend the full majesty of God. We see it partially in the calling of Isaiah in chapter 6 of Isaiah. He's so awestruck in the vision that he cannot speak. He need he needed a special dispensation from God that allowed him to open his mouth. In Revelations, we have this wonderful descriptions of the, the, the heavenly beings falling down in worship to God and worship him, declaring, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And a bit later, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The only response to an encounter with the living God is awe and wonder at its purity, goodness, power and majesty. It is only when we truly pursue holiness that we get even a glimpse of this majesty. And we can only do that from a foundation of truth. To be holy, one must be obedient to God, the source of holiness. The immediate result of holiness is knowledge of the truth. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus says to the Jews who believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, literally if you abide in my word, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So the progression is first that you obey Jesus. 
And from that, he declares that you will be his, you are his disciples. And then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And it's that logical progressing from one to another. Obedience first. And some people will say, well, not really. Um, I think I, I think I know the truth. I think I can work things out for myself. No, it's not, not right. Jesus says we will be set free. Freedom to worship God in his majesty. For the purpose that we were created. But there are those people who just cannot comprehend. I've got my own mind. I can work things out. I'm a rational person. I can see what's true and what's false. I know when somebody's pulling the wall over my eyes. The Bible tells us, tells us the complete opposite. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God tells Cain. Like a ravenous lion ready to pounce. Satan looks for opportunities to deceive and to persuasively lead us astray. We cannot stand against the devil on our own. Even the archangel Michael didn't dare to do so in his own right. And we read this in uh, Jude. It says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the de devil about uh, Moses' body, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And the way I see this, if the Archangel Michael didn't dare, what chance do we have? From the very beginning, the devil has cunningly deceived, and we can only know the truth that matters by following Jesus. What are those things that really matter? What are the things that are key? I mean, you can know, for instance, that one plus one equals two. We accept that as a universal fact. A five-year-old could tell you that. But did you know that it takes over 360 pages of complex mathematics to prove definitively that 1 plus 1 equals 2? And it was, it was in the Principia Mathematica that was written by uh, Bertrand Russell and a guy called Alfred North Whitehead that they proved it from very first principles. And before that, oh, it had never been proved. Mathematicians were never sure whether it was actually true. And I would just wonder sometimes, what, I just wonder, what happens if they disproved it? What would, where would we be now? Our thoughts and minds are a false organ. Seemingly very simple things to us can have a deceptively false premise and lead us astray. Sometimes we take what seems the most easy narrative and the most easy narrative that, that benefits us and makes us feel good and puts the blame on others. It is the result of such things and such thinking that cause bloody wars and genocides. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. In John, um, John 18, verse 37, Jesus uh, answered Pilate when he stood before him, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate replied, what is truth? And then goes out. I, th I think Pilate was being honest, not that he didn't know the meaning of the word, but what did truth have to do with it? All he was concerned about was power and maintaining control over the masses. He had some slight qualms, I'll give you that. He had some slight qualms about because if he was to, 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 uh, to, to make a judgment, he wanted it to be the right judgment. His integrity, his, his personal esteem was at stake here, calling a spade a spade. And, and, um, but it didn't really figure because the most key and important thing to him was power and control, not what 
was the truth. The Latin version of the Bible, written, written around the 5th century AD, is um, when, it, when it quotes this, uh, quotes what is truth. When it says that, it says, it, it says, quod est veritas, what is truth? The Latin scholars will point out and tell you that an anagram of this is est fear quod adest. It is he here present. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Jesus himself declared to be the way, the truth and the life. In the first chapter of Romans, Paul talks about God's anger against people who plainly know the truth about God, but choose to suppress the truth by their wickedness. They exchange, exchange the truth of God for a lie. And this leads them down a path of extreme wickedness, encouraging and approving others to do wicked things. Further on in Romans, Paul talks of God's righteous judgment on the wicked, and that no one is without sin. No one is righteous before God. But through faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified by his grace. Because Jesus was a sacrifice of atonement, demonstrating his immeasurable love. On our behalf, he suffered for our sins. He suffered the wrath and the rejection of the Father. And all the things that rightfully should be ours, he took upon himself. This is the truth that we are talking about here. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. The other thing Paul tells us to consider must first have the foundation of truth. What can be noble if there is no truth? How can anything be considered worthy, right or pure if there is any taint of falsehood about it? Indeed, how can it be admirable, excellent or praiseworthy? In the, in the same letter to the Romans, uh, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, again, this is three quarters of the way through the letter, where he, where he actually tells them what he wants them to do. Paul tells them what they should do. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Verse 2. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. It all begins with our thoughts. What goes on there then manifests itself in actions by being able to test and approve God's pleasing and perfect will. Of course, Paul isn't telling us what to do without a reason. He spent, spent the first 11 chapters of this letter, of this book, some of which we've already mentioned, explaining why we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And someone once said jokingly, the problem with living sacrifices is that they have a habit of crawling off the altar. Of course, it doesn't mean that we physically harm ourselves. A few, few, few weeks ago, we had this passage in the older Sunday school group. And the way I put it to them was, how can you put a smile on God's face today that would be holy and pleasing to God? And that's what I put to you today. How can you put a smile on God's face? That is a holy and pleasing thing to God that we should do. Yeah.
we move towards the end of this video service, hopefully something spoken to you, connected with you. If you'd like to know more about knowing Jesus, that he is the source of our life, our holiness, our salvation, our hope, our truth, then do get in touch. If you'd like to know more about what your next, next steps might be in your journey with Jesus, do get in touch. We'd love to talk to you about that too. I'm going to pray a blessing as we draw to a close now. Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, lead us into this week. Fill us, guide us, encourage us, surprise us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.